My name is Sung Ji Lim Zee Lim, and I am from the Purcell School for Young Musicians. Today I'll be presenting about the potential of music for public health. A short introduction about myself. I am a rising senior at the Purcell School, which is a specialist music school located on the outskirts of London. I've been playing the cello for 10 years and am a keen musician at Purcell, participating in multiple chamber groups and orchestras. In addition to this, I am the founder and leader of an organization called Instruments Without Border and a part of the school's outreach program, Impulse. Other than music, I have a deep passion for biology and psychology. Some general information and introduction to music and health. It goes without saying that a life enriched by music tends to be better than one deprived of it. Music's ability to bequeath concrete health benefits, however, is often overlooked. Today, I plan to introduce the potential of music for public health in the hope that music and its various benefits for well-being, cognitive function, quality of life, and even happiness can be incorporated into more holistic and comprehensive health policies. At the individual level, music's therapeutic effects are given the greatest amount of emphasis. Florence Nightingale, for example, recognized that wind and string instruments have a soothing effect on the terribly ill. In this prototype of music medicine, a medical practitioner sought to utilize health to affect health directly. The more common form of music therapy employs evidence-based music interventions to affect health behavior and accomplish goals such as stress reduction, mood improvement, and self-expression. Both approaches are focused on music's benefits for individual health due to our various cultural contexts, life experiences, mental and physical health needs mean that our connection with music is as varied as it is personal. In order to explore music's potential for public health, then, we must first explore what the meaning of health is and the various ways in which the personalized experience of music can be reflected in larger communal and global health programs. So, according to the WHO Constitution in 1947, health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. The Ottawa Charter in 1986 then recognized health as a resource for everyday life, and this general expansion of our understanding of health as both preventing disease and promoting well-being has inspired health programs that engage people outside healthcare settings and at various stages of their lives, in part through the arts. In fact, McDonald in 2013 explains that motivated by a desire to investigate innovative, non-invasive, and economically viable interventions that embrace contemporary definitions of health, practitioners and researchers across the world have been developing and researching arts interventions. Then, in what ways does music affect health and well-being then? Through listening to music, the most common form of music intervention known as receptive mu music therapy, we can boost short-term memory, improve depressed moves, moods, assist cardiovascular function, and improve athletic performance. The more active forms of music therapy, including uh, learning to play an instrument, composing sheet music, or simply singing, come with the added benefits of adding greater cognitive load and forms of physical exercise with direct health benefits. Then what is actually involved in listening to music though? So what happens in our brain? When music enters our ears in the form of sound waves, its vibrations are relayed through the cochlea to the auditory nerves. These sounds, however, must be decoded and interpreted into the various properties of music that distinguish music from noise. For example, a small area in the right temporal lobe serves as serves an essential role in perceiving pitch, which forms the basis of melody, chords, and harmony. Another part in the temporal lobe is responsible for decoding timbre, which enables us to distinguish a violin from a cello performing the same note. The cerebellum processes rhythm, while the frontal lobes respond to emotional music by being activated, synchronized, um, and actively engaged in interpreting its emotional content. Moving on to music and the mind. Simply listening to music is already a complex task that requires that the human auditory system organize sounds into meaningful units through grouping similar or proximate objects together across time, melody, frequency, and harmony. To process time in music, we must take sense of rhythm, pulse, and meter, and it is a complex task involving all auditory, visual, proprioceptive, and vestibular perception. 
Active form or playing in, of playing an instrument has been positively connected to enhancing the brain's ability to master tasks that involve language skills, memory, and attention. For example, research conducted by Cy Louis at the per, uh, Berkeley College of Music and Harvard Medical School showed that senior participants in an eight-week music-based program demonstrating in increases in functional connectivity between the auditory system and medical prefrontal cortex, a communicative pathway reinforcing memory functions. Now, music and mood. The role of music in regulating mood, in particular stress, has been thoroughly researched and confirmed. For instance, studies suggest that listening to music can influence one's subjective perception so that, so that an upbeat tune can help one put an optimistic outlook on a stressful situation. One 2013 suggested that listening to musical class music classified as happy and upbeat could improve mood and overall happiness in just a matter of weeks. Now, in conclusion, uh, what can be done to harness the immense potential of music for public health? We can get some hints from already some already successful programs. Musical activity is an important component of many public health programs for the elderly because of its well-known benefits for the aging brain. To introduce just one, Carnegie Mellon University researcher Jenny Doris developed a group marimba class for local seniors with mild cognitive impairment. Another example is a study called Community of Voices. In this study, it was found that participants reported reduced feelings of loneliness, um, higher self-esteem, and feeling of stronger cultural identity. They also reported beneficial physical effects, including improved breath capacity and uh, psychosocial effects such as higher assertiveness and confidence in one's voice. A final example to talk about is a personal project that I am doing. It's an app called Datum. And it's an app for using music to help individuals reluctant to visit doctors to attempt a diagnostic test and provide a test that may offer greater accuracy than long winding questionnaire type tests. As a public health tool, it addresses various systematic social barriers preventing individuals from receiving proper comprehensive diagnosis. From these three examples, we can get a sense of things that can be done to harness the potential of music for public health. In all, physical and mental public health will both be highly benefited when programs like the ones just mentioned are carried out. Here are my references, and I would like to thank uh, GHLC at JHU for giving me the opportunity to present. If there are any questions, feel free to contact me using my email. Thank you. Hmm.